Good day to you. Today we have a story that is uh, involving the collection of bodies for science. It's a very interesting industry. Uh, I don't know a lot about it. I do know in recent years there's been various news articles of people illegally acquiring bodies or selling parts off bodies they're not supposed to. But this story takes place far off and away and a long time ago uh, with the, the main characters doing that. At first, I thought I'd read this story before, and I actually hadn't. I was mixing up for a, a story called Skullduggery, published in 2000, written by Kathleen Carr. There's another series also called Skullduggery, but that one's like, it looks like a, some sort of comic book or whatever. I'm not really sure, I've never read that one. But it, uh, that one uh, followed the, the tale and adventure of a young man being an apprentice to some sort of phrenologist or scientist or whatever and recovering a series of skulls for him. I don't remember how it ended. It's been like more than 20 years since I've read that story, but this should be an interesting one. Enjoy. The Body Snatcher by Robert Louis Stevenson. Every night in the year, four of us sat in the small parlor of George at Debenham, the Undertaker and the Landlord and Fetz and myself. Sometimes there would be more, but blow high blow low, come rain or snow or frost, we four would be each planted in his own particular armchair. Fetz was an old drunken Scotchman, a man of education, obviously, and a man of some property since he lived in idleness. He had come to Debenham years ago while still young, and by a mere continuance of living, had grown to be an adopted townsman. His blue camlet cloak was a local antiquity, like the church spire. His place in the parlor at the George, his absence from church, his old, crapulous, disreputable vices were all things, of course, in Debenham. He had some vague radical opinions and some fleeting infidelities, which he would, now and again, set forth and emphasize with tottering slaps upon the table. He drank rum, five glasses regularly every evening, and for the greater portion of his night, nightly visits to the Georges, sat with his glass in his right hand in a state of melancholy alcoholic saturation. We called him the doctor, for he was supposed to have some special knowledge of medicine, and had been known, upon a pinch, to set a fracture or reduce a dislocation, but beyond these slight particulars we have no knowledge of his character and antecedents. One dark winter night, it had struck nine some time before the landlord joined us. There was a sick man in the George. A great neighboring proprietary. Proprietor suddenly struck down with apoplexy and on his way to Parliament. And the great man's still greater London doctor had been telegraphed to his bedside. It was the first time that such a thing had happened in Debenham, for the railway was but newly open and we are, were all proportionately moved by the occurrence. He's come, said the landlord, after he f filled and lighted his pipe. He, said I, who, not the doctor. Himself, replied our host. What is his name? Dr. McFarlane, said the landlord. Fetz was far through his third, th was far through his third tumbler, stupidly fuddled, now nodding over, now staring mazily around him. But at the last word, he seemed to awaken and repeated the name, McFarlane, twice. Enough quietly enough the first time, but with sudden emotion the second. Yes, said the landlord. That's his name, Dr. Wolf McFarlane. Fetz became instantly sober. His eyes awoke, his voice became clear, loud and steady, his language forcibly in earnest. We were all startled by the transformation, as if a man had risen from the dead. I beg your pardon, he said. I'm afraid I've not been paying much attention to your talk. Who is this Wolf McFarlane? And then, when he had heard the landlord out, It cannot be, it cannot be, he added. And yet, I would like well to see him face to face. Do you know him, doctor? asked the undertaker with a gasp. God forbid, was the reply, and yet the name is a strange one. It were too much of a fancy, too. Tell me, landlord, is he old? Well, said the host, 
He's not a young man, to be sure, and his hair is white, but he looks younger than you. He is older, though. Years older, but with a slap upon the table. It's the rum you see in my face. Rum and sin. This man, perhaps, may have an easy conscience and a good digestion. Conscience, hear me speak. You would think I was some good, old, decent Christian, would you not? But no, not I. I never canted. Voltaire might have had canted if he stood in my shoes, but the brains, with a rattling Philip on his bald head, the brains were clear and active, and I saw and made no deductions. If you know this doctor, I ventured to remark after a somewhat awful pause, I should gather that you do not share the landlord's good opinion. Fetz paid no regard to me. Yes, he said with sudden decision. I must see him face to face. There was another pause, and then the door, and then a door was closed rather sharply on the first floor, and a step was heard upon the stair. That's the doctor, cried the landlord. Look sharp and you can catch him. It was but two steps from the small parlor to the door of the old George Inn. The wide oak staircase landed almost in the street. There was room for a turkey rug and nothing more between the threshold and the last round of the descent. But this little space was every evening brilliantly lit up, not only by the light upon the stair and the great signal lamp below the sign, but by the warm radiance of the bar room window. The George thus brightly advertised itself to passers-by in the cold street. Fetz walked steadily to the spot, and we, who were hanging behind, beheld the two men meet, as one of them had phrased it, face to face. Dr. McFarlane was alert and vigorous. His white hair set off his pale and placid, although energetic, countenance. He was richly dressed in the finest of broadcloth and the whitest of linen, with a great gold watch chain and studs and spectacles of the same precious material. He wore a broad folded tie, white and speckled with lilac, and he carried on his arm a comfortable driving coat of fur. There was no doubt, but he became his years breathing as he did, of wealth and consideration, and it was a surprising contrast to see our parlor sought, bald, dirty, pimpled, and robbed in his old camlet cloak, confront him at the bottom of the stairs. McFarlane, he said somewhat loudly, more like a herald than a friend. The great doctor pulled up short on the fourth step, as though the familiarity of the address surprised and somewhat shocked his dignity. Toddy McFarlane, repeated Fetz. The London man almost staggered. He stared for the swiftest of seconds at the man before him, glanced behind him with a sort of scare, and then in a startled whisper, Fetz, he said, you. I, said the other, me. Did you think I was dead too? We're not so easy shut out of our acquaintance. Hush, hush, exclaimed the doctor. Hush, hush, this meeting is so unexpected. I can see you are unmanned. I hardly knew you, I must confess at first, but I am overjoyed, overjoyed to have this opportunity. For the present, it must be how do you do and goodbye in one, for my fly is waiting, and I must not fail the train, but you shall see, let me see, yes, you shall give me your address and you can count on early news of me. We must do something for you, Fetz. I fear you are out at elbows, but we must see to that for all the lang syne as once we sang at suppers. Money, cried Fetz. Money from you. The money that I had from you is lying where I cast it in the rain. Dr. McFarlane had talked himself into some measure of superiority and confidence, but the uncommon energy of this refusal cast him back into his first confusion. A horrible, ugly look came and went across his almost venerable countenance. My dear fellow, he said, be it as you please. My last thought is to offend you. I would intrude on none. I will leave you my address. However, I do not wish it. I do not wish it to know the roof that shelters you, interrupted the other. I heard your name. I feared it might be you. I wish to know if, after all, there were a god. I know now that there is none. Be gone. He stood in the middle of the rug, between the stair and the doorway, and the great London physician, in order to escape, would be forced to step to one side. It was plain that he hesitated before the thought of his humiliation. 
White as he was, there was a dangerous glitter in his spectacles, but while he was still paused and certain, he became aware that the driver of his fly was peering in from the street at this unusual scene and caught a glimpse at the same time of our little body from the parlor, huddled by the corner of the bar. The presence of so many witnesses decided for him to want at once flee. He crouched together, brushed down the wainscoat, and made a dart like a serpent, striking for the door. But his tribulation was not yet entirely at an end, for even as he was passing, Fetz clutched him by the arm, and these words came in a whisper, and yet painfully distinct. Have you seen it again? The great rich London doctor cried out aloud with a sharp, throttling cry. He dashed his questioner across the open space, and with his hands over his head, fled out the door like a detected thief. Before it had occurred to one of us to make a movement, the fly was already rattling towards the station. The scene was over like a dream. The dream had left proofs and traces of its passage. Next day, the servant found the fine gold spectacles broken on the threshold, and that very night we were all standing breathless by the bar room window, and Fetz at our side, sober, pale, and resolute in look. God protect us, Mr. Fetz, said the landlord, coming first into possession of his customary senses. What in the universe is all this? These are strange things you have been saying. Fetz turns toward us. Fetz turned towards us. He looked at us, each in succession in the face. See if you can hold your tongues, he said. That man, McFarlane, is not safe to cross. Those that have done so already have repented it too late. Fetz turns... <laughs> Sorry, here, I got a little lost. And then, without so much as finishing his third glass, far less waiting for the other two, he bade us goodbye and went forth, under the lamp of the hotel, into the black night. We'd returned to our places in the parlor, with the big red fire and four clear candles, as we recapitulated what had passed. The first chill of our surprise soon changed into a glow of curiosity. We sat late. It was the latest season, it was the latest session I have known in the old George. Each man, before we parted, had his theory that he was bound to prove, and none of us had any nearer business in this world than to track out the past of our condemned companion and surprise the secret that he shared with the great London doctor. It is no great boast, but I believe I was better hand at worming out a story than either of my fellows of the George, and perhaps there is no, there is now no other man alive who could narrate to you the following foul and unnatural events. In his young days, Fett studied medicine in the schools of Edinburgh. He had talent of a kind, the talent that picks up swiftly what it hears and readily retells it, for its own. He worked little at home, but he was civic, attentive and intelligent in the presence of his masters. They soon picked up, picked him out of as a lad who listened closely and remembered well. Nay, strange as it seemed to me when I first heard it, he was in those days well favored and pleased by his exterior. There was, at that period, a certain extramural teacher of anatomy, whom I shall here designate by the letter K. His name was subsequently too well known. The man who bore it skulked through the streets of Edinburgh in disguise, while the mob that applauded at the execution of Burke called loudly for the blood of his employer. But Mr. K was then at the top of his vogue. He enjoyed a popularity due partly to his own talent and address, partly to the incaps incapacity of his rival, the university professor. The students, at least, swore by his name, and Fetz believed himself and was believed by others to have laid the foundations of success when he had acquired the favor of this me uh, meteorical famous man, Mr. K. Mr. K was a bon vivant, as well as an accomplished teacher. He liked a sly illusion no less than a careful preparation. In both capacities, Fetz enjoyed and deserved this his notice, and by the second year of his attendance, he had held the half-regular position of second demonstrator or sub-assistant in this class. In this capacity, the charge of the theater and lecture room devolved and particularly upon his shoulders. He had to answer for the cleanliness of the premises and the conduct of the other students, and it was a part of his duty to supply, receive, and divide the various subjects. It was with a view to this last, at the time very delicate, 
affair that he was lodged by Mr. K in the same wind, and at last in the same building with the dissecting rooms. Here, after a night of turbulent pleasures, his hands still tottering, his sight still misty and confused, he would be called out of his bed in the black hours before the winter dawn by the, the unclean and desperate interlopers who supplied the table. He would open the door to these men, since infamous throughout the land. He would help them with their tragic burden, pay them their sordid pri price, and remain alone when they were gone with the unfriendly relics of humanity. From such a scene, he would return to snatch another hour or two of slumber to repair the abuses of the night and refresh himself for the labors of the day. Few lads could have been more insensible to the impressions of a life thus passed among the ensigns of morality. I think, I believe that's ensigns, sorry. Ensigns of morality. His mind was closed against all general considerations. He was incapable of interest in the fate and fortunes of another. The slave of his own desires and low ambitions. Cold, light, and selfish in the last resort. He had the modicum of prudence, miscalled morality, which keeps a man from inconvenient drunkenness or punishable theft. He coveted besides a measure of consideration from his masters and his fellow pupils, and he had no desire to fail conspicuously in the eternal external parts of life. Thus, he made it his pleasure to gain some distinction in his studies, and day after day rendered unimpeachable eye service to his employer, Mr. K. For his day of work, he indemnified himself by nights of roaring, blackguardly enjoyment, and when that balance had been struck, the organ that he called his conscience declared itself content. The supply of subjects was a continual trouble, is what continually troubled him as well as to his master. In that large and busy class, the raw materials of the autonomist kept perpetually running out, and the business thus rendered necessary was not only unpleasant in itself, but threatened dangerous consequences to all who were concerned. It was the policy of Mr. K to ask no questions in his dealings with the trade. They bring the body and we pay the price, he used to say, dwelling on the alliteration. Quid pro quo. And again, and somewhat profanely, ask no questions. He would tell his assistants for conscience sake. There was no understanding that the subjects were provided by the crime of murder. Had that idea been broached to him in words, he would have recoiled in horror, but the lightness of his speech upon such grave matters, so grave a matter, was in itself an offense against good manners and a temptation to men with whom he dealt. Fetz, for instance, had often remarked to himself upon the singular freshness of the bodies. He had been struck again and again by the hand hangdog, abominable looks of the ruffians who came to him before the dawn and putting things together clearly in his private thoughts. He perhaps attributed a meaning too immoral and too categorical to the unguarded consuls of his master. He understood his duty. In short, to have three branches, to take what was bought, to pay the price, and to avert the eye from any evidence of crime. One November morning, his policy of silence was put sharply to the test. He had been awake all night with a racking toothache, pacing his room like a caged beast or throwing himself in fury on his bed, and had fallen at last into that profound, uneasy slumber so that so often follows a night of pain. When he was awakened by the third or fourth angry repetition of consecrated signal, I'm sorry, <laughs> consecrated, we're getting wild here, concerted signal, there was a thin, bright moonshine. It was bitter, cold, windy, and frosty. The town had not yet awakened, but an indefinable stir already preluded the noise and busyness of the day. The ghouls had came later than usual, and they seemed more than unusually eager to be gone. Fetz, sick with sleep, slided, lighted them up the stairs. He heard their grumbling Irish voices through a dream, and as they stripped the sack from their sad merchandise, he leaned dozing, with his shoulder prop against the wall. He had to shake himself to find the men their money. As he did, his, soul, his eyes lighted on the dead face. He started. He took two steps nearer, with the candle, and raised. God Almighty, he cried. That is Jane Galbraith. 
The men answered nothing, but they shuffled near the door. I know her, I tell you, he continued. She was alive and hearty yesterday. It's impossible she can be dead. It's impossible you should not have got this body fairly. Sure, sir. You're mistaken entirely, said one of the men. But the other looked Fetz darkly in the eyes and demanded the money on the spot. It was impossible to misconceive the threat or the exaggerated the danger. The lad's heart failed him. He stammered some excuses, counted out the sum, and saw his hateful visitors depart. No sooner were they gone than he hastened to confirm his doubts. By a dozen unquestionable marks, he identified the girl he had jested with the day before. He saw, with horror, marks upon her body that night. Might well betoke violence. A panic seized him, and he took refuge in his room. There he reflected at length over the discovery that he had made. He considered soberly the bearing of Mr. K's instructions and the danger to himself of interference in so serious a business. And at last, in sore perplexity, determined to wait for the advice of his immediate superior, the class assistant. This was a young Dr. Wolf McFarlane, a high favorite among all the reckless students, clever, dissipated, and unscrupulous to the last degree. He had traveled and studied abroad. His manners were agreeable and a little forward. He was an authority on the stage, skillful on the ice or the links with skate or golf club. He dressed with nice audacity, and to put the finishing touch upon his glory, he kept a gig and a strong trotting horse. With Fetz, he was on terms of intimacy. Indeed, their relative positions called for some community life, and when subjects were scarce, the pair would drive far into the country in McFarland's gig, visit and desecrate some lonely graveyard, and return before dawn with their booty in the door of the dissecting room. On that particular morning, McFarland of McFarland arrived somewhat earlier than his wont. Fetz heard him and met him on the stairs, told him his story, and showed him the cause of his alarm. McFarlane examined the marks of her body. Yes, he said with a nod. It looks fishy. Well, what should I do? asked Fetz. Do? repeated the other. Do you want to do anything? Least said soonest men did, I should say. Someone else might recognize her objected Fetz. She was as well known as the Castle Rock. Well, I hope not, said McFarlane. And if anybody does, well, you didn't, don't you see? And there's an end. The fact is, this has been going on too long. Stir up the mud and you'll get K into the most unholy trouble. You'll be in a shocking box yourself. So will I, if you come to that. I should like to know how any one of us would look. Or what the devil we should have to say for ourselves in any Christian witness box. For me, you know there's one thing certain, that, practically speaking, all our subjects have been murdered. McFarlane, cried Fetz. Come now, sneered the other, as if you hadn't suspected it yourself. Suspecting is one thing, and proof is another. Yes, I know, and I'm sorry as you are, this should have come here tapping the body with his cane. The next best thing for me is to not recognize it, and he added coolly. I don't. You may if you please. I don't dictate, but I think a man of the world would do as I do, and I may add. I fancy that is what K would look for at our hands. The question is, why did he choose us two for his assistance? And I answer, because he didn't want old wives. This was the tone of all others to affect the mind of a lad like Fetz. He agreed to imitate McFarlane. The body of the unfortunate girl was duly dissected, and no one remarked or appeared to recognize her. One afternoon, when his day's work was over, Fetz dropped into a popular tavern and found McFarlane sitting with a stranger. This was a small man, very pale and dark, and coal black eyes. The cut of his features gave a promise of intellect and refinement, which was but feebly re realized in his manners, for he proved, upon a nearer acquaintance, coarse, vulgar, and stupid. He exercised, however, a very remarkable control over McFarlane, issues, issued orders like the great Basha, became inflamed at the least discussion or delay, and commented rudely on the servility with which he was obeyed. The most offensive person took a fancy to Fetz on the spot, 
plied him with drinks and honored him with unusual confidences on his past career. If a tenth part of what he confessed was true, he was a very loathsome rogue. He was a very loathsome rogue. And the lad's vanity was tickled by the attention of so experienced a man. I'm a pretty bad fellow myself, the stranger remarked. But McFarlane is the boy. Toddy McFarlane, I call him. Toddy, order your friend another glass. Or it might be, Toddy, you jump up and shut the door. Toddy hates me, he said again. Oh, yes, Toddy, you do. Don't you call me that confounded name, growled McFarlane. Hear him? Did you ever see the lads play knife? He would like to do that all over my body, remarked the stranger. We medicals have better ways than that, said Fetz. When we dislike a dead friend of ours, we dissect him. McFarlane <laughs> looked up sharply, as though his jest was scarcely to his mind. The afternoon passed. Gray, for that was the stranger's name, invited Fetz to join them at dinner, ordered a feast so sumptuous that the tavern was thrown into a commotion, and when all was done, commanded McFarlane to settle the bill. It was late before they separated. The man Gray was incapably drunk. McFarlane, sobered by his fury, chewed the cut of the money he had been forced to squander and the slights he had been obliged to swallow. Fetz, with various liquors singing in his head, returned home with devious footsteps and a mind entirely in abeyance. Next day, McFarlane was absent from class, and Fetz smiled to himself as he imagined him still squaring the intolerable Gray from the tavern from tavern to tavern. As soon as the hour of liberty had struck, he posted from place to place in quest of his last night's companions. He could find them, however, nowhere, so returned early to his rooms, went early to bed, and slept the sleep of the just. At four in the morning, he was awakened by the well-known signal. Descending to the door, he was filled with astonishment to find McFarlane with his gig, and in the gig, one of those long and ghastly packages which he was so well acquainted. What? he cried. Have you been out alone? How did you manage? But McFarlane silenced him roughly, bidding him to turn to business. When they had got the body upstairs and laid it on the table, McFarlane made at first as if he were going away. Then he paused and seemed to hesitate, and then... You better look at the face said he in tones of some constraint. You had better, he repeated, as Fats only stared at him in wonder. But where, how, when did you come by it? cried the other. Look at the face, was the only answer. Fats was staggered. Strange doubts assailed him. He looked from the young doctor to the body, and then back again. At last, with a start, he did as he was bidden, bidden, he had almost expected the sight of that met his eyes, and yet the shock was cruel. To see, fixed in the rigidity of death, and naked on that coarse layer of sack's cloth, the man whom he had left well clad a full of meat and sent upon the threshold of a tavern, awoke. Even the thoughtless fets some of the terrors of the conscious. It was a crass tibi which re-echoed in his soul that two whom he had known should have come to lie upon these icy tables. Yet, these were only secondary thoughts. His first concern regarded Wolf. Unprepared for a challenge so momentous, he knew not how to look his comrade in the face. He durst not meet his eye, and he had neither words nor voice at his command. It was McFarland himself who had made the first advance. He came up quietly behind and laid his hand gently but firmly on the other's shoulder. Richardson, said he, may have the head. Now Richardson was a student who had long been anxious for the portion of the human subject to dissect. For that portion of the human subject to dissect. There was no answer, and the murderer resumed. Talking of business, you must pay me. Your accounts, you see, must tally. Fetz found a voice, the ghost of his own. Pay you? he cried. Pay you for that? Why, yes, of course you must. By all means, and on every possible account, you must, returned the other. I dare not give it for nothing. You dare not take it for nothing. It would compromise us both. This is not as another case like Jane Galbraith's. The more things were wrong, the more we must act as if they're all right. Where does old Kay keep his money? 
There, answered Fetz hoarsely, pointing to a cupboard in the corner. Give me the key then, said the other calmly, holding out his hand. There was an instant's hesitation, and the die was cast. McFarlane could not suppress a nervous twitch, the infinitesimal mark of an immense relief as he felt the key between his fingers. He opened the cupboard, brought out a pen and ink and paper book that stood in one compartment, and separated from the funds in a drawer a sum suitable to the occasion. Now look here, he said. There's a payment made. First proof of your good faith. First step to your security. You now, you have now to clinch it by the second. Enter the payment in your book, and then you, for your part, my defy the devil. May defy the devil. The next few seconds were for Fetz an agony of thought. But in balancing his terrors, it was the most immediate that triumphed. Any future difficulty seemed almost welcome if he could avoid a present quarrel with McFarlane. He set down the candle which it had been he had been carrying all this time, and with a steady hand entered the date, the nature, and the amount of the transaction. And now, said McFarlane, it's only fair that you should pocket the lucre. I've had my share already, by the by. When a man of the world falls into a bit of luck, has a few shillings extra in his pocket, I'm ashamed to speak of it, but there's a rule of conduct in the case. No treating, no purchase of expense, expensive class books, no squaring of old debts. Borrow, don't lend. McFarlane, began Fetz, still somewhat hoarsely. I put my neck in a halter to oblige you. To oblige me? cried Wolf. Oh, come. You did as near as I can see the matter. What you downright had to do in self-defense. Suppose I got into trouble. Where would you be? This second little matter flows clearly from the first. Mr. Gray is the continuation of Miss Galbraith. You can't begin and then stop. If you begin, you must keep on beginning. That's the truth. No rest for the wicked. A horrible sense of blackness and treachery of fate seized upon the soul of the unhappy student. My God, he cried, but what have I done? And when did I begin? To be made a class assistant in the name of reason, where's the harm in that? Service wanted the position, service might have gotten it. What, would you have been where I am now? My dear fellow, said McFarlane, what a boy you are. What harms have come to you? What harm can come to you if you hold your tongue? Why, man, do you know what this life is? There are two squads of us, the lions and the lambs. You are a lamb. You'll come lie upon these tables like Gray or Jane Galbraith. If you're a lion, you'll live and drive a horse like me, like Kay, like all the world with any wit or courage. You're staggered at the first, but look at Kay. My dear fellow, you're clever. You have pluck. I like you, and Kay likes you. You were born to lead the hunt. And I tell you, on my honor and my experience of life, three days from now, you'll laugh at all these scarecrows like a high school boy at a farce. And with that, McFarlane took his departure and drove up to the wind in his gig to get under cover before daylight. Fetz was thus left alone with his regrets. He saw the miserable peril in which they stood involved. He saw with inexpressible dismay that there were no limits to his weakness and that from concession to concession, he had fallen from the arbiter of McFarlane's destiny to his paid and helpless accomplice. He would have given the word, world to have been a little braver at the time, but it did not occur to him that he might still be brave. The secret of Jane Galbraith and the curse of the entry of, in the day book closed his mouth. Hours passed. The class began to arrive, and members of the unhappy Grey were dealt out to one and to another and received without remarks. Richardson was made happy with a head, and before the hour of freedom rang, Fetz trembled in exultation to perceive how far they had already gone towards safety. For two days, he continued to watch with increasing joy. The dreadful process of disguise. On the third day, McFarlane made his appearance. He had been ill, he said but he made up for lost time by the energy with which he directed the students, and Richardson, in particular, he extended the most valuable assistance and advice, and that student, encouraged by the praise of the demonstrator, 
burned high with ambitious hopes, and saw the metal already in his grasp. Before the week was out, McFarlane's prophecy had been fulfilled. Fetz had outlived his terrors and had forgotten his bases. He began to plume himself upon his courage, and Sud so arranged the story in his mind that he could look back at these events with an unhealthy pride. Of his accomplice, he saw but little. They met, of course, in the business of the class. They received their orders together from Mr. K. At times, they had a word or two in private. McFarlane was from first to last particularly kind and jovial, but it was plain that he had avoided any reference to their common secret, and even when Fetz whispered to him that he had cast in his lot with the lions and forsworn the lambs, he only signed to him, smiling, to hold his peace. At length, an occasion arose which the pair once more into a closer union. Mr. K was again short of subjects. Pupils were eager, and it was part of this teacher's pretensions to be always well supplied. At the time, <laughs> this is cursed. At the same time, there came the news of a burial in the rustic graveyard in Glencourse. Time has little changed the place in question. It stood then as now upon the crossroads, out of call of human habitations, and buried fathom deep in the foliage of six cedar trees. The cries of the sheep upon the neighboring hills, the streamlets upon either hand, one loudly singing among pebbles, the other dripping furatively from the pond to pond. The stir of the wind and mountain hit mountainous old flowering chestnuts, and once and even once in seven days, the voice of the bell and the old tunes of the presenter were the only sounds that disturbed the silence around the rural church. The Resurrection Man to use a by name of the period, was not to be deterred by any of the sanctities, sorry, sanctities of customary piety. It was part of his trade to despise and desecrate the scrolls and trumpets of old tombs, the path worn by the feet of worshippers and mourners, and the offerings and the inscriptions of bereaved affections to rustic neighborhoods, where love is more than commonly tenacious, and where some bonds of blood or fellowship unite and the entire society of a parish, the body snatcher, far from being repelled by a natural respect, was attracted by the ease and safety of the task. The bodies that had been laid in earth, in joyful expectation of a far different awakening, there came that hasty, lamplit, terror-haunted resurrection of the spade and mattock. The coffin was forced, the cerements cer torn, and the melancholy relics, clad in sackcloth, after being rattled for hours on moonless byways, were at length exposed to the uttermost indignities before a class of gaping boys. Somewhat as two vultures may swoop upon a dying lamb, Fetz and McFarlane were to be let loose upon a grave in that green and quiet resting place. The wife of a farmer, a woman who had lived for sixty years, had been known for nothing but good butter and a godly conversation, was to be rooted from her grave at midnight and carried dead and naked to that faraway city that she had always honored with her Sunday's best. The place beside her family was to be empty till the crack of doom. Her innocent and almost venerable members to be exposed to that last curious curiosity of the autonomist. Anatomist, not autonomous, anatomist. Late one afternoon, the pair set forth, well wrapped in cloaks and furnished with a formidable bottle. It rained without remission, a cold, dense lashing rain. Now and again, there blew a puff of wind, but these sheets of falling water kept it down. Bottle and all, it was a sad and silent drive as far as Pinnacook. There they were to spend the evening. They stopped once to hide their implements in a thick bush not far from the churchyard, and once again at the fisher's tryst to have a toast before the kitchen fire and a very and vary their nips of whiskey with a glass of ale when they reached their journey's end the gig was housed the horse was fed and comforted and the two young doctors in a private room sat down to the best dinner and the best wine the house could afford the lights the fire the beating rain upon the window the cold the incongruous work that lay before them added zest to their enjoyment of the meal with every glass, their cordiality increased. Soon McFarlane handed a little pile of gold to his companion. A compliment, he said. Between friends, these little accommodations ought to fly like pipe lights. Fetz pocketed the money and applauded the sentiment to the echo. You are a philosopher, he cried. 
I was an ass till I knew you. You and Kay, between you, by the Lord Harry, but you'll make a man of me. Of course we shall, applauded McFarlane. A man, I tell you. It required a man to back me up the other morning. There was some big brawling 40-year-old cowards who would have turned sick to the look of the DD things. The DD thing. I apologize. Oh. A little dead. Maybe it's dead. I'll have to look this up. There's a D hyphen D. I actually don't know what that is. That's like throwing me off because it showed up a couple times. But not you. You kept your head. I watched you. Well, and why not? Fetz thus vaunted himself. It was not a affair of mine. It was no affair of mine. There was nothing to gain on the one side but disturbance. And on the other, I could count on your gratitude, don't, I, don't you see? And he slapped his pocket till the gold pieces rang. McFarlane somehow felt a certain touch of alarm at these unpleasant words. He may have regretted that he had taught this young companion so successfully, but he had no time to interfere, for the other nose noisily continued in this boastful strain. The great thing is not to be afraid. Now, between you and me, I don't want to hang. That's practical. But for all, can't. McFarlane, I was born with a contempt. Hell, God, devil, right? Wrong, sin, crime, and all the old gallery of curiosities. They may frighten boys, but men of the world like you and me despise them. Here's to the memory of Gray. It was by this time growing somewhat late. The gig, according to a the gig, according to order, was brought round to the door with both lamps brightly shining, and the young men had to pay their bill and take the road. They announced that they were bound for Peebles, and drove in that direction till they were clear of the last houses of town, then extinguished the lamps, returned upon their course, and followed a, a by-road towards Glencourse. There was no sound but that of their own passage, and the incessant, strident pouring of the rain. It was pitch dark. Here and there, a white gate or a white stone in the wall guided them for a short space all across the night. But, for the most part, it was a foot pace. And almost groping. That they had picked their way through the resonant blackness to their solemn and isolated destination. In the sunken woods that traversed the neighborhood of the burying ground, and the last glimmer failed them. And it became necessary to kindle a match and re-illuminate one of the lanterns of the gig. Thus, under the dripping trees and environed by huge and moving shadows, they reached the scene of their unhallowed labors. They were both experienced in such affairs and powerful with the spade, and they had scarce been twenty minutes at their task before they were rewarded by a dull rattle of the coffin lid. At the same moment, McFarlane, having hurt his hand upon a stone, flung it carelessly above his head. The grave in which they now stood almost to the shoulders was close to the edge of the plateau of the graveyard, and the gig lamp had been propped, the better to illuminate their labors against a tree, and on the Im immediate verge of the steep bank descending to the stream. Chance had taken a sure aim with the stone, then came a clang of broken glass. Night fell upon them, sounds alternately dull, and ringing announced the bounding of the lantern down the bank, and its occasional collision with the trees, a stone or two which had dislodged its descent, rattled behind it in the profundities of the glen, and then silence, like night, resumed its sway. And they might bend their hearing to its utmost pitch, but naught was to be heard except the rain, now marching to the wind, now steadily falling over miles of open country. They were so nearly at the end of their arbored task that they abhorred, sorry, arbored, no, a bored task, a bored task, that they judged its wisest to complete it in the dark. The coffin was exhumed and broken upon, the body inserted in the dripping sack and carried between them to the gig, one mounted to keep it in its place, and the other taking the horse by the mouth, groped along by the wall and bush till they reached the wider road by the fisher's tryst. Here was a faint, diffused radiancy, which they hailed like daylight. By that, they pushed the horse a good pace and began to rattle along merrily in the direction of the town. They had both been wedded to the skin during their operations, and now, as the gig jumped among the deep ruts, the thing that stood propped between them fell now upon one of the, upon one and now upon the other. At every repetition, the horrid contact each instinctively repelled it with the greater haste, and the process, naturally although it was, began to tell upon the nerves of the companions. 
McFarlane had made some ill-favored jest about the farmer's wife, but it came hollowly from his lips and was allowed to drop in silence. Still their unnatured burden, a natural burden, bumped from side to side, and now the head would be laid, as if in confidence upon their shoulders, and now the drenched sackcloth would flap icily about their faces. A creeping chill began to possess the soul of Fetz. He peered at the bundle, and it seemed somewhat larger than at first. All over the countryside, and from every degree of distance, the farm dogs accompanied their passage with tragic ululations, and it grew and grew upon his mind that some unnatural miracle had been accomplished, and that some nameless change had befallen the dead body, and that it was in fear of their unholy burden that the dogs were howling. For God's sake, said he, making a great effort to arrive at speech, for God's sake, let's have a light. Seemingly, McFarlane was affected in the same direction, for though he made no reply, he stopped the horse, passed the reins to his companion, got down, and proceeded to kindle the remaining lamp. They had by that time no farther than crossed the road down to Auckliny. Auckenclinny. The rain still poured as though the deluge were returning, and it was no easy matter to make a light in such a world of wet and darkness. When at last the flickering blue flame had been transferred to the wick and began to expand and clarify, and shed a wide circle of mist brightness around the gig, it became possible for the two young men to see each other in the thing they had looked along with them. The rain had molded the roughing sack to the outlines of the body underneath, and the head was distinct from the trunk, and the shoulders plainly mold modeled. Something at once spectral and human riveted their eyes upon the ghastly comrade of their drive. For some time, McFarland stood motionless, holding onto the lamp. A nameless dread was swathed, like a wet sheet about the body, and tightened the white skin upon the face of the fetz. A fear that was meaningless, a horror of what could not be, kept mounting to his brain. Another beat of the watch, and he had spoken, but his comrade had forestalled him. That is not a woman, said McFarland in a hushed voice. It was a woman when we put her in, whispered Fetz. Hold that lamp, said the other. I must see your face. As Fetz took the lamp, his companion untied the fastenings of the sack and drew down the cover from the head. The light fell very clear upon the dark, well-molded features and smooth-shaven faces of a too familiar countenance. Countenance often beheld in dreams of both these young men. A wild yell rang upon into the night. Each leaped from his own side into the roadway. The lamp fell, broke, and was extinguished, and the horse, terrified by this unusual commotion, bounded and went off towards Edinburgh at a gallop, bearing along with it a sole occupant of the gig, the body of the dead and long dissected, Gray. Wow, that was really scary and spooky way back yonder in the Chattahoochee. No, I'm kidding. Back when I was in like elementary school, we would have a Halloween fair of sorts where they would have a, a wall with holes cut in it where you would stick your hand into a container and then they, they would tell you what the thing was. And like one of them would say like eyeballs. And then obviously, well, at least I hope because I never saw the other side of it, but obviously it wasn't a bunch of fucking jug full of eyeballs. It was just like peeled grapes or something silly. This story kind of hits and touches on that. The imagination is a, a powerful thing with uh, without context and all of your senses to take advantage of. You can, you can witness all sorts of crazy shit. Enjoy a fearsome touch of death by Robert E. Howard. As long as midnight cloaks the earth, with shadows grim and stark, God save us from the Judas kiss of a dead man in the dark. Old Adam Farrell lay dead in the house wherein he had lived alone for the last twenty years. A silent, cheerless recluse, in his life he had known no friends, and only two men had watched his passing. Dr. Stein, Stein rose and glanced out the window into the gathering dusk. You think you can spend the night here, then? He asked his companion. This man, Fallred by name, assented. Yes, certainly, I guess it's up to me. Rather a useless and primitive custom, sitting up with the dead, commented the doctor, preparing to depart. But I suppose, in common decency, we'll have to bow to the precedents. Maybe I can find someone who will come over here and help you with your vigil. Falred shrugged his shoulders. I doubt it. Farrell wasn't liked. Wasn't known by many people. I scarcely knew him myself. But I don't mind sitting up with the corpse. Dr. Stein was removing his rubber gloves 
and Falred watched the process with an interest that was almost amounted to fascination. A slight, involuntary shudder shook him at the memory of touching these gloves. Slick, cold, clammy things, like the touch of death. You may get lonely tonight if I don't find anyone, the doctor remarked as he opened the door. Not superstitious, are you? Falred laughed. Scarcely, to tell the truth. From what I hear of Farrell's disposition, I'd rather be watching his corpse than have been his guest in life. The door closed and Falred took up his vigil. He seated himself in the only chair the room boasted, glanced casually at the formless sheeted bulk on the bed opposite of him, and began to read by the light of the dim lamp which stood on the rough table. Outside the darkness gathered swiftly, and finally Falred laid down his magazine to rest his eyes. He looked again at the shape which had, in life, been the form of Adam Farrell, Wondering what quirk in the human nature made the sight of a corpse not only so unpleasant, but such an object of fear to many. Unthinking ignorance, seeing in dead things a reminder of death to come, he decided lazily, and began idly contemplating as to what life had held for this grim and crabbed old man, who had neither relatives nor friends, and who had seldom left the house wherein he had died. The usual tales of miser hoarder, hoarded wealth had accumulated, but Falred felt so little interest in the whole matter that it was not even necessary for him to overcome any temptation to pry about the house for possible hidden treasure. He returned to his reading with a shrug. The task was more boresome than he had thought for. After a while, he was aware that every time he looked up from his magazine and his eyes fell upon the bed, which its grim occupant, he started involuntarily as if he had, for an instance, Forgotten the presence of the dead man, it was unpleasantly reminded of the fact. The start was slight and instinctive, but he felt almost angered at himself. He realized for the first time, he uttered in dead in silence, which unenwrapped the house, a silence apparently shared by the night, for no sound came through the window. Adam Farrell had lived as far apart from his neighbors as possible, and there was no other house within hearing distance. Falred shook himself, as if to rid his mind of unsavory speculations, and went back to his reading. A sudden vagrant gust of wind whipped through the window, in which the light and the lamp flickered and went out suddenly. Falred, cursing softly, groped in the darkness for matches, burning his fingers on the hot lamp chimney. He struck a match, relighted the lamp, and glanced over at the bed. Got a horrible mental jolt. Adam Farrell's face stared blindly at him, the dead eyes wide and blank, framed in the gnarled gray features. Even as Falrud instinctively shuddered, his reason explained the apparent phenomenon. The sheets that covered the corpse had been carelessly thrown across the face, and a sudden puff of wind had disarranged and flung it aside. Yet, there is something grisly about this one. Something fearsomely suggestive. As if, in the cloaking dark, a dead hand had flung aside the sheet, just as if the corpse were about to rise. Falred, an imaginative man, shrugged his shoulders at these ghastly thoughts and crossed the room to replace the sheet. The dead eyes seemed to stare at him, malevolently, with an evilness that transcended the dead man's churlishness in life. The workings of a vivid imagination, Falred knew. And he recovered... He recovered the gray face, shrinking as his hand chanced to touch the cold flesh, slick and clammy, the touch of death. He shuddered with the natural revulsion of the living for the dead and went back to his chair and magazine. At last, growing sleepy, he lay down upon a couch which, by some strange whim of the original owner, formed part of the room's scant furnishings and composed himself for slumber. He decided to leave the bright. He decided to leave the light burning, telling himself that it was in accordance with the usual custom of leaving lights burning for the dead. For he was not willing to admit to himself that already he was conscious of a dislike for lying in the darkness with a corpse. He dozed, 
awoke with a start and looked at the sheet on the bed. Silence reigned over the house, and outside it was very dark. The hour was approaching midnight, with its accompanying eerie domination over the human mind. Falred glanced again at the bed where the body lay, and found the side of the sheet object most repellent. A fantastical idea had birthed in his mind and grew, that beneath the sheet, the mere lifeless body had become a strange, monstrous thing, a hideous, conscious being that watched him with his eyes, which burned the f through the fabric of the cloth. This thought, a mere fantasy, of course, he explained to himself by the legends of vampires, undead, ghosts, and such like, the fearsome attributes with which the living have cloaked the dead for countless ages, since primitive man first recognized in death something horrid and apart from life. Man feared death, thought Falred. And some of his fear of death took hold on the dead so that they, too, were feared. And the sight of the dead and gendering grisly thoughts gave rise to dim fears of hereditary memory lurking back in the dark corners of the brain. At any rate, that silent hidden thing was getting on his nerves. He thought of uncovering the face on the principle that familiarity breeds contempt. The sight of the features, calm and still in death, would banish, he thought. All such wild conjectures as were haunting him in spite of himself. But the thought of those dead eyes staring in the lamplight was intolerable. So at last, he blew out the light and lay down. This fear had been stealing upon him so insidiously and gradually that he had not been aware of its growth. With the extinguishing of the light, however, and the blotting out of the sight of the corpse, things assumed their true character and proportions, and Falred fell asleep almost instantly. On his lips, a faint smile for his previous folly. He awakened suddenly. How long had he been asleep, he did not know. He sat up, his pulse pounding frantically, the cold sweat beating in his forehead. He knew instantly where he was, remember the other occupant of the room. But what had wakened him? A dream? Yes, now he remembered. A hideous dream in which the dead man had risen from the bed and stalked stiffly across the room with eyes of fire and a horrid leer frozen on his gray lips. Falred had seemed, a lot, seemed to lie motionless, helpless, then as the corpse reached a gnarled and horrible hand, he had awakened. He strove to pierce the gloom, but the room was all blackness, and all without was so dark that no gleam of light came through the window. He reached a shaking hand towards the lamp, then recoiled as if from a hidden serpent. Sitting here in the dark with a fiendish corpse was bad enough, but he dared not light the lamp for fear that his reason would be snuffed out like a candle at what he might see. Horror, stark and unreasoning had full possession of his soul. He no longer questioned the instinctive fears that rose in him, all those legends he had heard come back to him and brought a belief in them. Death was a hideous thing, a brain-shattering horror, imbuing lifeless men with horrid malevolence. With horrid malevolence. That one always gets me. Adam Farrell and his life had been simply a cheerless but harmless man, but now he was a terror, a monster, a fiend, lurking in the shadows of fear, ready to leap on mankind with talents dipped deep in death and insanity. Falred sat there, his blood freezing, and fought out his silent battle. Faint glimmerings of reason had begun to touch his fright when a soft, stealthy sound again froze him. He did not know, he did not recognize it as the whisper of the night wind across the windowsill. His frenzied fancy knew it only as the tread of death and horror. He sprang from the couch, then stood undecided. Escape was in his mind, escape was in his mind, but he was too dazed to even try to formulate a plan of escape. Even his sense of direction was gone. Fear had so stultified his mind that he was not able to think consciously. The blackness spread in long waves about him, and its darkness and void entered into his brain. His motions, such as they were, were instinctive. He seemed shackled with mighty chains, and his limbs responded sluggishly, like an imbecile's. 
A terrible horror grew up in him and reared its grisly shape. That the dead man was behind him, was stealing upon him from the rear. He had no longer thought of lighting the lamp. He no longer thought of anything. Fear filled his whole being. There was room for nothing else. He backed slowly away in the darkness, hands behind him, instinctively feeling the way. With a terrific effort, he partly shook the clinging mist of horror from him, and the cold sweat clammy upon his body strove to orient himself. He could see nothing. But the bed was across the room in front of him. He was backing away from it. There was where the dead man was lying, according to all rules of nature. If the thing were, as he felt, behind him, then the old tales were true. Death did not implant in lifeless bodies an unearthly animation, and dead men did not roam the shadows to work their ghastly and evil will upon the sons of men. Then, great God, what was man but a wailing infant, lost in the night and beset by frightful things from the black abyss and the terrible unknown voids of space and time. These conclusions he did not reach by any reasoning process. They leaped, leaped, full grown into his terror-dazed brain. He worked his way slowly backward, groping, clinging to the thought that the dead man must be in front of him. That his back-flung hands encountered something, something slick, cold, and clammy, like the touch of death. A scream shook the echoes, followed by the crash of a falling body. The next morning, they came to the house of death, found two corpses in the room. Adam Farrell's sheeted body lay motionless upon the bed, and across the room lay the body of Fallred, beneath the shelf where Dr. Stein had absentmindedly left his gloves. Rubber gloves, slick and clammy to the touch, of a hand groping in the dark, a hand of one fleeing his own fear. Rubber gloves, slick and clammy and cold, like the touch of death. Well, that was roughly an hour of horror stories. If you enjoyed that, please let me know in the comments down below. Thank you for listening and or watching. I hope you have a lovely evening, assuming you weren't trying to fall asleep. And in which case, I hope you have nightmares uh, aplenty. Um, if you enjoyed this, please let me know in the comments section if you have the time and leave a like. And of course, subscribe. And on my end, I'll try to keep it consistent and I'll try to keep it casual. Thank you. Oh, and if you have thoughts about the stories, please share. And if you have other stories you think would be good, please share. Or else. Please share. Please share. Please share. Please share. Please share. Please share. Or else.